welcome to your online um, midweek Bible study and welcome to our guests who are here with us. <laughs> so blessed to see all of you and we're really blessed by our worship music. So thank you Sam and Julie and Pastor Greg. So for our announcements this, this evening, we would just like to let you know about our protocol, how we're going to be meeting on Sunday. Sunday morning we'll have both services at 8 a.m as well as 9.30 a.m. We will enter through the main door and then we will exit out of our side doors. Now families may sit together in groups and then distancing between family groups and masks are strongly appreciated and they're even required. So our um, online services will, will continue to be available in conjunction with our live gatherings on both Wednesday nights and our Sunday morning services. So either way, you get blessed if you're online or if you're with us. We're just glad that you're still with us. So thank you so much, and we love you. Oh, thanks, Connie. God bless you. Praise the Lord, man. I can now call this a full house after two months, right? <laughs> Man, what a trip. But we're grateful that uh, we have a, a, a good group uh, physically and a, a good group virtually. So we're covering all the bases, and so we're grateful. And we know that we are in the presence of the Lord, and that's the bottom line. So what a joy. Turn with me, if you would. Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, and as you're turning to Isaiah chapter 11, I mean, if you find the Psalms, then keep going, and uh, you'll run into Isaiah before you know it, but the Psalms is kind of a good, play, a good uh, place to anchor, and then either go left or right, but this time you'll go right uh, to Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter 11, and now this evening, we're going to be introduced to Jesse's offspring. Jesse's offspring, and we're going to be learning about the, a rod or even a branch. Jesse's offspring. Now, Jesse, as you Bible students know, Jesse is the father of King David. Now, about this time, during this time of Isaiah, the royal family, David's family, remember David and then Solomon, and after Solomon, I mean, Solomon really kind of had a, a time of it. He didn't represent the Lord that well, even though God used King Solomon. Uh, Solomon had some troubles with some women and things, as you recall, like a thousand women. So I guess he didn't quite get it, you know, but, uh, you know, live and learn, I suppose. But after that time, after Solomon's death, then the we remember the nation of Israel actually split into both northern and southern kingdom, the way we recognize the, that during Isaiah's day. And so the Lord here speaking through Isaiah is, again, going to introduce us to Jesse's offspring, if you will, because David's royalty was practically forgotten. And it's, it's sort of sad, but the, God the Holy Spirit, I'm convinced by introducing us to King David's dad, who was a relative unknown. He was a farmer. Uh, he, he would be completely unknown if it wasn't for his son David, I'm, I'm certain. But I'm, I'm convinced that the Lord is introducing Jesse's offspring to show us that our Savior, Jesus Christ, came from humble stock. Jesse. King David's dad. We almost wouldn't even know who he was, like I say. And so Jesus coming from these humble roots, but yet Jesus the life giver. So tonight in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, we're going to see the establishment of King Jesus on earth. And this, these are all things that are coming in the, in the very the far future. But Isaiah is just under the influence of God the Holy Spirit. And so verses 1 through 5, we'll see the establishment of King Jesus on earth. Verses 6 through 9, we will look at, at the new look of the world. Brand new look of, the, of, our, of our world. 
Verses 10 through 16, we will be introduced to the millennial reign. Now remember, as we've been going through the book of Isaiah, we have to remember there's, there's 66 chapters in Isaiah, so we can't get the whole snapshot of 66 chapters you know, in two weeks. Things unfold as the weeks unfold. And so we're going to be looking at uh, the millennial reign. And then tonight, it, it we'll finish up with chapter 12, which is just a, a few verses. But really, it should, chapter 11 shouldn't have broken. In fact, chapter 10 and 11 should have been, chapter 10 should have included chapter 11 and chapter 12, basically. But apparently, the, the, those that were canonizing our modern day scriptures thought it was just too lengthy, and they broke it up into chapters 10, 11, and 12. But technically, 10, 11, and 12 should be chapter 10. But anyway, nonetheless, we, we get that. But we're going to, in chapter 12, we'll look at worship during the millennial reign. And the millennial reign, you and I will be reigning with Jesus. And so that'll be kind of fun. So last time, Isaiah told us that the Lord is going to cut down and dismantle. Isaiah is going to cut down the Assyrian army, in other words, the, the pagan world. But then also the Lord is going to dismantle and redistribute, if you will, the nation of Israel throughout the world. And so that's where we left off last time. So Lord, we ask you, Lord God, to give us clarity tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we can come and to worship and to praise, to lift our hearts, our hands, and our voices, as we've done every day and every night. But it's just nice to have that beautiful accompaniment. And what a blessing, Lord, to be able to come together in, more, in, in a bit more embellished worship opportunity. Although we, we thank you and we bless you for every opportunity, it's just nice to highlight, Lord. And we're glad that you're glorified in that. So thank you for this time. Bless your word now, Lord, as we move into your word. Speak to us through Isaiah, through you, God, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we pick up tonight at Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Isaiah speaking. Isaiah tells us, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And so once again, as we introduce this chapter, we see that we had King David. He was royalty, a famous king, a man after God's own heart. But his siblings, his children, I should say, dropped the ball. Solomon, very self-absorbed, dropped the ball. And so, the, so Isaiah is introducing this rod or this branch out of the humble roots of Jesse. God is highlighting Jesse, Dad Jesse. And so it's an amazing thing. And so after really the, the time that, that Israel has been scattered, now we remember we're, we're constantly looking, as we recall, at, at dual prophecies, a prophecy that's going to occur fairly quickly, yet in the future, and then prophecies that are yet to come. Prophecies that I believe that we may actually see. I mean, how much further can we run amok without Jesus returning, without the Father God saying, that's enough. Come on home, church. I mean, I hope it's tonight, right? Like right after the study, it'd be great. You know, like 802, as we're kind of wrapping up, hey, God bless you, have a great week. He said, oh no, we'll, we'll meet in the air. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be great. I mean, but so... But we see that, that the Lord is, is identifying Jesse, this humble root of Jesse. And that's an amazing thing. And so, so from the, the branch, from the, the stump, as things are just mowed over, as we kind of saw last time, the Lord was introducing the idea, I'm just going to cut everything down. And when you and I, we look at a stump in the, in the yard, and many of us have experienced this in the backyard, we cut down a tree, we thought, okay, I'll never have to worry about that again, right? And then two years later, all of a sudden, we see some little sprigs coming out, right? We're thinking, wait a minute, I thought I did away with that thing. And then if we let it go two or three years later, man, the thing's starting to grow again. 
So life comes out of certain things that we consider dead, and that's what the Lord is saying here. Hey, you considered my line of Jesse to be dead, but out of that barren, what you saw was barren, this root, this rod, this branch shall spring forth. Life shall spring forth of what many considered dead. Verse 2, and so the Spirit of the Lord, and so this root is Jesus Himself, so the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him. Isaiah continues on, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might will likewise rest on this branch. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord shall rest upon this new work that's being identified. So the Spirit of the Lord, the wisdom of the Lord, understanding of the Lord, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord quite simply identified as honor for the Lord. Respect for the Lord. And when we respect and, we, and when we honor the Lord, then we, when we're in that position, once we've accomplished those two things, respect and honor, we then freely give reverence to the Lord. But we can't have reverence for the Lord prior to honor or respect. And some people, some uh, personalities in our lives have tried to introduce us to that, that idea. They, they come up to us and say, hey man, why don't you pray, pray to the big guy for me? And sort of thing. We say, that's not honoring. I mean, you know those bells and whistles that went off in your head when someone came to you seriously. Hey, you know, would you, would you talk to the big guy? Hey, would you talk to the old man? You know, for me? You know, I mean, that just chills run up our spine when we hear that sort of stuff. And we've all heard, we've all been a part of that to some degree. You know what I'm saying. That's not honor. That's not being respectful. And so it's certainly not giving reverence. And so we don't, entertain any of that kind of nonsense. We reverence the Lord. We honor God. We bend the knee. And we do it because we fear the Lord. Oh, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you ever think about meeting the Lord? Often I do, and I have to be real, real honest with you. When I consider meeting the Lord, that's a scary thing to me sometimes. It really is. Because He's God and I'm not. But I reverence Him. And I also, but I also know that He says, hey, come into my presence. I get all that, you know, and we want to say, oh, Jesus is my buddy and God's my Father. I get all that. And it's all great. But when I take a Selah once in a while, I say, man, Lord, I owe you everything. And he's God. And we bend the knee. And so we do. We come in. We enter in with fear, but we enter in with love. There's a balance. Because we honor and respect, and then that develops these other postures. That non-believers, they don't get it. They can't get it because they don't know who God is. They've heard of God, but they don't know who He is. They've heard of Him. And, that, and they come up short in that regard. So, identifying this branch, Jesus, the Spirit shall rest upon him, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of his Father. Remember Jesus often said in the New Testament, my desire is to do my Father's will. Not your will, Father. I mean, I really don't, is there a different way other than the cross, but, Father, not my will, your will be done. Praise the Lord. That's reverence for the Father. Verse 3, his delight is in the fear of the Lord once again. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, 
and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Isn't that amazing? And it really has to show us how far, how we sh fall short in our own judgments and our own opinions. Because Jesus here doesn't judge by the sight of his eyes. That's the only way we can judge though, isn't it? But we've got to be very careful with that. If we don't ask for discernment, we will make decisions with our eyes, won't we? And if we don't ask God the Holy Spirit, would you give me discernment in this scenario? In this decision? If we don't ask, then we'll just judge by the sight of our own eyes. And you know what? I don't know about you, but my eyesight is getting worse every year. Right? So I'm not starting with a whole lot of confidence here. And that's a good thing, because I want to say, Lord, I can't do this. And that's the words that the Lord wants to hear. Oh, good. Now I'm going to do it through you. How's that sound? And we all say, great. No trouble. So we don't judge. So, so Jesus is not going to judge by the sight of his eyes. I mean, we know he's God. But yet Jesus emptied himself, Paul tells us. Jesus emptied himself. But yet God the Holy Spirit filled Jesus as a man with his spirit. So even though Jesus set his deity aside, he was still operating at 100% God because God the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? We have that relationship with God the Holy Spirit. I wish I could just pull the plug on my ideas more often and just drain myself a lot more. You know where I'm coming from. More of you, Lord, less of me. And that's the example that God... The son gave us. He emptied himself. He said, you know what? I'm going to put it aside. But I'm not going to be alone. I'm going to be refilled with God the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the perfect example. Oh, man, and we strive. Lord, help us. We strive to let God the Holy Spirit fill us, not only to the top, but to overflowing. And it comes and goes, and we know that. But don't, don't, wouldn't, don't we wish that it would just go constantly overflowing 24-7? Man, Lord, help us. And that's our challenge. But Jesus is not going to judge by the sight of his eyes, nor is he going, going to decide by the hearing of his ears. What did you hear today? Ooh, you, what was it? Ooh, tell me. Ooh, ooh, ooh. What was it? You know what? Put it away. Put it away. Never mind. Never mind. But Jesus is going to judge with righteousness. Man, that's a relief, isn't it? That is a relief. He'll judge with righteousness. And then once, once again, with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Paul talks about that idea concerning the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul says, is, as we get into the second letter this coming Sunday, as the Lord allows, Paul's going to be identifying in the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, hey, when the Antichrist is revealed, and this is during the uh, end time scenario, when the Antichrist is revealed and Jesus comes back the second time, Jesus is going to wipe the Antichrist out just with his word because he's God. In the beginning, God. And Jesus spoke the universe into existence. And so just with Jesus' words, he will wipe out the evil for the rest of our days. Man, that's exciting. Exciting. So we see these connections with Isaiah and Thessalonians. And again, Paul was certainly a student of the prophet Isaiah. Certainly a student, I'm convinced, of course. Since Paul, of course, was a was an outstanding Bible scholar. But Paul was very fascinating, fascinated with Isaiah's writings. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Close. Right, righteousness and faithfulness. Isn't that great? I mean, we say a lot of times, oh, I want to be faithful to you, Lord. You know, next time you think of it, thank God for his faithfulness. And I don't know about you, but God has been so faithful for me. My brother came in the office the other day, 
and he explained to me that he had just briefly, he, he casually mentioned that he had fallen away at a younger time in his life, fallen away from the Lord. But then, and, I, and so I was listening very intently, and he said, when I came back, he, he's just saying now, you know, I'll never fall away from the Lord. And I can dig it, because I did the same thing. I fell away from the Lord, but now that I've come back, you know what? It doesn't matter. But the Lord was faithful and is faithful to you and I. I mean, we want to be faithful, but let's make sure we turn and say, thank you, Jesus, for being so faithful to us. Never giving up on us. And that's great. So righteousness and faithfulness. These are representations. These are the things that Jesus will, as we know, has demonstrated. But Isaiah is just forecasting this. Hey, this branch will come out of the root of Jesse. Now we'll see a little different idea here on the, on the earth. In verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And so we're, we're looking at now the millennial reign. This is after the war of Armageddon. This is after the Antichrist has been imprisoned. The Antichrist will be imprisoned for a thousand years. This is after the seven-year tribulation period. During that seven-year tribulation period, you and I as born-again believers has been, have been up at the banqueting table of Jesus. And as bro Bob used to always say, all the pizza and Pepsi-Cola you can drink and eat. Uh, man, I like it. All the pizza and Pepsi-Cola you can handle. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll have those seven years in that banqueting time. Hanging out with Jesus. And then Jesus will come back and imprison all evil. He'll capsule all evil and throw it into what is considered a holding cell. And then for a thousand years, we, you and I, as born-again believers, will come from that banqueting table and then we will reign for a thousand years with Jesus. And there'll be a new earth. And on that new earth, this is what we're, gonna, we're going to witness and experience the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb right I mean currently the the only way the lamb resides with the wolf is the lamb is in the wolf's stomach but during the millennial reign there'll be peace is what Isaiah is writing the wolf shall dwell with the lamb the leopard shall lie down with the young goat I mean who ever heard of such a thing right the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. The young lion, are you kidding? The aggressive animal that we're familiar with, hey, it'll be totally different during this millennial time. It's going to be great. And the little, sh the little child shall lead them. Can you imagine that? Your grandchildren, you know, one of your, your grandbaby leading this fierce young lion by the mane and that lion goes, okay, where are we going? That's the millennial reign. That's the reign that you and I, we're going to oversee with Jesus. It's going to be great. The cow and the bear, they shall graze. I mean, a, who's seen a bear grazing? You know, when I'm out fishing or something up in Yosemite and I see a bear, I don't hang around. I don't want to see his eating habits. I've got a pretty good idea. So I scoot. But yet during these times, the cow and the bear, they shall graze. The bear grazing on grass? Hey, the Lord made that bear. He'll put that diet together exactly the way he sees fit. This is good stuff. Their young ones shall lie down together. The cow and the bear, hey, their young, young ones will hang out. And the, the lion shall eat straw just like the ox. Isn't that amazing? The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Now this is a little extra important to me because tomorrow morning I've got to go touch up our Calvary Chapel sign out here on Limonite, right? And the thing is, is I've got to walk through about an acre of dry grass that's up to my, it's going to be up to my knees, and with this hot weather, Man, I'm praying, verse 8 here, Lord, let me be a nursing child playing by the cobra's hole and let him come out and say, Morning, Greg, how are you? 
I'll say, great, I'm fine. Because, man, I'm, my eyes are going to be peeled. I'm going to go out early in the morning when it's, a, when it's a little cooler. But, man, I'm thinking, man, Lord, I wish I would have had a chance to do this, you know, a month ago when it was still kind of cloudy and things. But, I mean, you know, I, I trust the Lord. I mean, I'll be smart about it. But I, I was just cracking up. Say, Lord, I, I'd like to identify with this tomorrow morning. Would you mind? You know? So praise the Lord. I'd like to play by the viper's den without any, any, any problems whatsoever. My wife would appreciate it if I came back and, you know, with no holes, no two little holes in my ankle and things. You know, she, she would appreciate that. Hey, you're sweating and you're, you're pale. What's your problem? <laughs> or your leg is ballooning up. And I'll be saying, I'll be saying, hey, get, get me to the ER. <laughs> yes. No, I'll take my shotgun and <laughs> praise the Lord. Verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Isn't that going to be great? Peace in the land. Man, can you not wait? I, I can hardly wait. It's going to be great. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, right now we can look out, we can look at a beautiful sunrise and we can just see nature identifying the glory of God. But then, you know what, tomorrow when that sun gets up at about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, it's going to be hot. You know what I'm saying? So nature is beautiful and nature proclaims the glory of God, but this is a broken world. I was just looking at the news and out in Palm Desert, it's already 110 degrees. And the thing about Palm Desert is it never really cools down. I mean, it'll be 110, 115, 120 degrees in the, in the summer. And then in, at night, at 2 o'clock in the morning, it's still 98 degrees. You know, your house never cools off. You know, you walk out and you, you touch the, the, the side of your house. It's hot all the time in Palm Desert, you know, in those desert communities. I, I just, man, it's tough. And, and such. But the world is broken. And this is what Isaiah is being trained here. Hey, during the millennial time, this is the way, this world, this environment is the way that God originally meant the world to be. And this is our description. Peace and comfort and joy and getting along. It's going to be great. And you and I, we get to oversee that. It's going to be great. So the knowledge, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. So the, the earth will respond correctly to God's designs. And it's going to be, it's just glorious. The Lord now speaking in verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Once again, we're coming back to that root and that branch. Who shall stand as a banner to the people. Jesus will be the banner. The people won't be holding a banner. It will be Jesus standing. I'm it. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And you know that. So during these times, Jesus will be standing like a banner. We'll, all eyes, in other words, will be on Jesus. For the Gentiles shall seek Him, and His resting place shall be glorious. Doesn't that sound great? His resting place shall be glorious. Man, soon and very soon, we're going to see the King. But we've got Jesus in our hearts now. We get that. But man, soon and very soon, we're going to be face to face. It's going to be great. It shall come to pass that in that day, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. God's people, the nation of Israel. And you know what's nice? You and I as Gentiles, we have been grafted in. So we are part of it. We have not taken the place of the nation of Israel. We have embellished the nation of Israel. We have been grafted in. And so for the second time, he will recover the remnant of his people who are left. From Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the seas. And so when the rapture happens, as Paul's been telling us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when Jesus calls us up to meet him in the air those that don't have Christ will be left behind for the seven year period you and I will be taken up 
And so Isaiah is speaking to those who during that seven year period come to their senses and say, wow, Jesus is real. And when they confess Christ, then these will be the people that are ushered into the millennial reign provided they didn't take the mark. Now, one thing about the mark, you don't take it accidentally. You cannot accidentally receive the mark. When the Antichrist comes with the mark and his minions, you're going to know, the people are going to know what they're receiving. So don't worry that, you know, you'll, you might go into a coma or something and some wicked doctor injects you with a, some sort of a, a you know, a, 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 a transistor or something. That's, not, that's a non-issue. That is not the mark of the beast. You will know that the people, you and I will be raptured. Okay, we're gone. But those that are here on earth during the tribulation time, they will have a choice. Just like you have a choice to receive Christ now or not, they will have, everyone here left will have a choice. Would you like to receive the mark? Well, what's the mark all about? Oh, well, it's, for, it's an economic thing and yada, yada. Uh, this is, we need to have this and you need to participate. And people will know, they'll say, oh, that sounds very convenient. Sure, I'll take the mark. You know, I'll take it on the forehead or on the, on the hand, whatever. They'll know what they're getting. And likewise, other people that kind of heard grandma in the kitchen speaking to the grandkids about Jesus and about the rapture, those that didn't receive Christ but are, le are left behind after the rapture, they, they're going to start remembering grandma's stories and say, wait a minute. This is one of the stories that grandma told me. And, it's, and then they'll, they're going to say, I cannot take the mark. In fact, I've got to run for the hills. As Jesus instructed to his Jewish friends in, Mark, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24. Hey, run for the hills. Oh, but they're going to catch up to you eventually in your hideout. But at least for the first half, run away. And, and they'll find you out or you'll starve to death one or the other. But you will be ushered in. Those that remain here, we're raptured. But those that remain after the rapture and don't have the mark and either expire during the seven year period or whatnot, they will be ushered into the millennial period. And they will then operate in a thousand year reign much like we were like we're supposed to be operating today but not with the challenges and there'll be a thousand year reign of perfection and amazingly at the end of that thousand year reign satan will then be released from his holding cell and satan will literally come out and speak to people if you will and i'm just making this very simple and i'm sure it's going to be very simple but he's going to say hey do you want to follow christ or do you want to follow me? And people are literally going to say, gee, I've lived a thousand years in perfect harmony, but you know what? I think I'll go with Satan. That's what's going to happen. Yet other people are going to say, you know what, man? Jesus Christ, he's the one. I'm sticking with him. And I just find it amazing that some people will choose to go with Satan. And those will go with Satan will be immediately wiped out in the battle of Armageddon. It's, and it's over. That's it. Then they're wadded up and throw, cast into the lake of fire. That's it. Never to be heard from again. And then those who have accepted Christ and put their faith in Christ, we will then live for eternity. But the Lord is giving that thousand year period to demonstrate that he is desiring that none should perish. He's giving a thousand year reign of perfection and people are still going to reject his authority. Blows my mind. But of course we don't have to go very far. In the heavenly realm, a third of the angels. Can you imagine being in the presence of God, Jehovah God, I mean for 10 seconds or 10 years, but to be in his presence for any amount of time and then say, oh no, I think I'll go with this, this clown over here. And a third of the angels did. It, it boggles our minds. And I'm glad it does. But don't stop praying for your loved ones. Don't stop praying for them. They need your prayers. They need your 
concern for them. They need that conversation that you give them. You've got to talk to them. You've got to continue to pour into them. But his resting place, nonetheless, shall be glorious. And we look forward to that. Again, soon and very soon. And so those that are left, the Lord will call, hey, come. Those, that you, those of you that ran to the hills, like Jesus instructed. Those that ducked and didn't take the, didn't take the mark. Now it's time, come for the millennial reign. And during that millennial reign, Isaiah will tell us later, that there'll be offspring likewise. So there'll be some folks that are 999 years old, and there'll be other folks that are just a, you know, a mere 300 years old. You know, and there'll be you know, youngsters, you know, little kids. But, that, but it'll be this thousand-year reign of perfection, and Jesus will reign. It's just going to be glorious. And so that's what, that's what Isaiah is saying here. Hey, the Lord will call you back. He's, he's dispersed you throughout the world right now, but, but he'll call you back. And, of course, we see in modern day, we see modern day Israel is reconvening. Yes, but, you know, that's the immediate future, but the, fu the millennial future is yet to come. Yet to come. And so Isaiah is saying, hey, you'll be called back. So the Lord is giving that positive message. Hey, you're being corrected, but you're not being forgotten. And that's what's being said here through Isaiah. And so the Lord will call back from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, etc., etc. He'll call you back. He will set up a banner for all the nations, and they will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So when the Lord calls you back during this millennial time, you'll come. You'll come, and you'll be welcomed. Also, the envy of Ephraim, Ephraim representing the northern kingdom, the envy of Ephraim shall depart. Right now we have a divided kingdom. But during this time, the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. And so this sibling rivalry will end. This divided nation will be over. There will be peace in the valley once again. But together, the northern kingdom and the, the southern kingdom, the united kingdom, verse 14, shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Throughout the Old Testament, we see the Philistines as the constant enemy of Israel. But now a united Israel shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hands on Edom and Moab. Moab was the, the very southern, southern area, south of the southern uh, of, of Judah. And, so the, and, and uh, they shall lay their hands on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. And so the children of Israel will take their rightful place once again with Christ reigning, and you and I reigning with Christ. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. And so Egypt will no longer be bad-mouthing or, or saying, hey, we're going to go after Israel. That'll end. That'll end. With his, with his mighty wind, he will shake his fist over the river. And generally, when you see the, the word river capitalized like this, this means the Euphrates River. He will shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. Just like the Red Sea. The Lord will speak and his people will come and they will return to the promised land. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. And so Isaiah is saying, hey, remember when Moses led the mighty nation out of Egypt, it's going to be exactly the same way during this millennial time. The Lord will say, come, come back home, and you will have a highway to travel on, and people will return. And finally, verse 12, and in that day. Now, in that day, we've got to be reminded, is a statement, in that day is a statement that Isaiah introduced to us back in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. 
in that day briefly just means in that day when the proud are humbled. And that's just a simple way. And that reminds us, when we see that statement in that day, and we've seen it several times, but it was just time for us to be reminded what that truly means. In that day, in other words, in the day of the Lord, when the Lord reveals Himself, when the Lion of Judah reveals Himself, in that day, the proud will be humbled. So, back to verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. In that day... You believers will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. We sang that song this morning, uh, this evening. You are my God, I will praise you. The song of Moses. As Moses was leading Israel out of Egypt, Moses' song, You are my God, and I will praise you. So in that day here in Isaiah chapter 12, You, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Nice. Behold, here's a proclamation, it's a statement. Behold, God is my salvation. He's my salvation. He's what I hold on to. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, that's just short for Yahweh, for Yah, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the highest name in the world, Yahweh, or capital L-O-R-D, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation, as we sang tonight, Psalm 83. That's going to be the song, as recorded here in Isaiah 12. Therefore, verse 3, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Remember Jesus all throughout the Gospel of John? Hey, come. Come to the water. Come to the water and drink. This is living water. And Isaiah had that, pre, had that pre-notion here. With joy. In the presence of God, we will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day, you shall say, and these are really songs, they're psalms. They're hymns, if you will. But in that day, once again, you will say, praise the Lord. We like saying that, don't we? Praise the Lord. It really get, keeps it, gets us back on an even keel. Hey, you know, I'm having a tough day, but you know what? Praise the Lord, man. Praise the Lord, because in all things, I give thanks. I don't like what's going on right now, but you know what? Praise the Lord. And that kind of gives us a little, little boost. So in that day you will say, praise the Lord. Call upon His name. Declare His deeds among the peoples. Make mention that His name is exalted. We're just witnessing. Hey, praise the Lord. God is good. Bless Him. Glorify Him. That's what's being said here. Sing to the Lord, for He has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. We're in His midst because He's everywhere, isn't He? And we know. We just need to be reminded now and again. And it's important to be reminded. We kind of go, oh yeah, God, you're here. He says, yeah. Thanks for tapping me on the shoulder and reminding me of that. He says, no, no problem. Praise the Lord. He, the Holy One of Israel, is in your midst. Psalm 105 and Psalm 98. What a blessing. What a great way to end the night. Amen. I can have the worship team come join. Let's go out praising the Lord. As we continue through the book of Isaiah, we're seeing that God is pronouncing His idea to the northern kingdom, trying to get their attention, but they're sinking fast. In that, God is also trying to get 
the southern kingdom's attention. But even though they're semi-attentive, they're kind of yawning. Let's make sure that we're, not, we're neither lukewarm or cold. Let's make sure that you and I are on fire for the Lord. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you for this evening. We bless you, Lord, for allowing us to have you speak to us tonight. Glorify yourself, Lord, as we continue to worship, continue to allow you to minister to us as we minister to you, Lord, in song. But as we get refreshed, we thank you. We want to thank you for this first gathering, our physical gathering. We are just grateful. Let us finish well, Lord, because you are good. Go before us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us by standing, won't you? Hi, everybody. Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying 
the videos, and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we want to challenge you, why not share these videos? You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.